Okay, so uh, I can begin. Maharaj, a uh, little adjust your uh, uh, screen, Maharaj. Just I see you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's fine, Maharaj. Okay. So we'll begin now. Uh, enough people online? Uh, Forty are there, Maharaj, already. Okay. Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpade Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Korange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavari Paschacha Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our ongoing class on Bhakti Shastri this evening we're going to approach chapter number 16, Divine and Demoniac Nature. Right? Before we do that, we'll just have a little revision of uh, what we've been covering. Let me just share the screen. Okay. Everybody seeing? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. All right. So, we covered these topics in the previous class. Here's some questions. Maybe we can quickly review them. What is the tree of the material world situated on? Someone can say? Desire. Yes, right, desire. Thank you. Then the English meaning, Urva Mulam and Adasakam, very easy for you people. Urva Mulam means? The roots. The roots growing up. Right, root growing up. And Adasakam? Okay. And what do the leaves of the banyan tree refer to? 
Vedic hymns. Vedic hymns. Vedic hymns. Okay, good. And then the tips of the branches of the senses, the twigs are the sense objects. This banyan tree is nourished by what? Three modes of nature. Thank you. Yes, the three modes of nature. And Asanga Shastrena. Very easy for you. What does it mean? But with the weapons of detachment. Right, the weapon of detachment. What do you have to do with the weapon of detachment? What are you going to do with it? Cut the tree. Yes, cut the tree, right? The tree of entanglement in this material world. Right, that's the idea. Cut the tree. Very good. We'll move ahead. Okay, divine and demoniac nature. First of all, we want to show you here this connection between the chapters. Chapter 14, remember we were discussing the three modes of nature and we were stressing the importance of cultivating the mode of goodness, coming out of passion and ignorance, coming up to the mode of goodness and then from the mode of goodness then we can transcend, right? That was chapter 14. None. Then the last class, chapter 15, we spoke about the banyan tree and the different branches on the tree. The lower branches represent the lower modes of nature, the lower life forms. We're also there, human beings. We're there with all the different animals, the cats and the dogs and all these things, they're all there in the lower branches. And on the upper branches, you have the higher planets, the demigods, Swargaloka, like that. So that was chapter 15. And then now we're moving ahead. Chapter 16, we're going to describe the divine and the demoniac natures. You can see the comparison between the three chapters. The divine nature means cultivating the mode of goodness and the demoniac nature is the mode of passion and ignorance. Okay, so this is the, you can see really the connection. It's nicely described for us in Srila Prabhupada's purport actually, in the first, in the very first uh, verse. In the purport there, Srila Prabhupada ex explaining here this, this connection between these three chapters. Important to remember this. Okay, so the first uh, verse goes on. Oh, well, here's the breakdown of the chapter. First three verses will describe all the divine qualities. Daivi Sampat. And then verse 4 will begin description of the demoniac qualities. First they will be listed in verse 4. So divine qualities, the first three verses you can see all the qualities which are listed. How many qualities? Anybody know? 26 Maharaj. Yes, 26, Maharaj. 26 qualities, right, 26 qu divine qualities. And uh, you have this, uh, I think, listed in your student handbook, in the student handbook, the 26 qualities are listed, right, in relation to the different varnas and ashrams. Now some of the qualities will be for sannyasis, just like the first one. Fearlessness, that is a quality which the sannyasis are supposed to have when they go out for preaching work. Just like Srila Prabhupada traveled to America at the age of 70 with no money. Just depending on Krishna, this is a, the system that the, the sannyasi doesn't depend on anyone, he simply depends only on Krishna, that Krishna will provide for him. He's left the home, he's left the family, 
and he has to be fearless. He doesn't, he shouldn't depend on people providing for him. So that's a quality for sannyasis. But then other qualities like charity, well, that's meant really to be the, you know, grihastas. They're expected to do that particularly those who are having some business and making a lot of money, then they should give some charity and they should support the other ashrams like the brahmacharis and the sannyasis and vanaprastas, retired people. And then Vedic study, Vedic study, this, should, this will be more for the brahmacharis, this, the students, they should study this. Austerity, this is for the vanaprastas, retired life. They should practice some austerity. One of the austerities which they do usually, go to visit holy places. Traveling to the holy places is an austerity. Some qualities are for everyone, like simplicity, truthfulness, these kind of things. They're good for everyone. So, you, I think uh, you may have your book there with you, do you? Yes, Prabhuji. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, then I'm going to get, we're going to do a little exercise, I'll just show you. Just a minute, let me show you. Can you all see this, this uh, slide? Hare Krishna. Yes, Are you able to see it? It's headed, uh, yes, headed Sampada Sam dai, Daivim Sampada, Sampada Daivim, right? Divine qualities, yes. right? Yes. So I'll just read it through for you, you can follow. Uh, so those godly characteristics are there. This is from Prabhupada's purport, uh, or from his lecture, no, apart from his purport, then apart from the lecture. Either, either you practice yourself to come to the godly characteristics, or there is a simple method. If you take to devotional service, all the godly qualities automatically come. This is the process. So in this age, to develop these godly qualities is very difficult. But if you take to Krishna consciousness, by the simple method, by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, then automatically you develop all the godly qualities. So what we want to do this evening here with you, we want to go through those 26 qualities and list particular activities which practice in devotional service which will help us to develop each quality individually, right? To give you an example, the first quality, fearlessness. So it's meant for sannyasis. So what does the sannyasi have to do to cultivate fearlessness? One thing he could do is simply chant Hare Krishna wherever he goes, doing the, the chanting of the holy name. Just like Lord Chaitanya went through the Jarakanda forest and the wild animals were there and Lord Chaitanya was chanting to them. He was chanting that Krishna, 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 Rakshamam. He was chanting like that to the animal. So the same way Sanyasi wants to cultivate fearlessness, he should, he has to remember Krishna. By remembering Krishna, 
then one will be fearless. Remember I told you how Srila Prabhupada was asked, what do you feel when you chant Hare Krishna? And Prabhupada replied, I feel no fear, <laughs> right? So you want to be fearless, the sannyasi is going out preaching, simply has to chant Hare Krishna. Anybody else has any other thoughts on this? What we could do to cultivate fearlessness? Depend on Krishna completely. Yeah, but how? How are we going to do that? I want to know practically how are we going to depend on Krishna completely? Be in association with devotees of Krishna. And then you depend on the devotees, right? <laughs> then you would be dependent. We completely surrender to Krishna and um, be convinced that Paramatma will completely help us at all times. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to know how do we go about doing that? What is your program to go about developing that surrender and depending on Paramatma? It, it's all right talking, but how are you going to do it? How do you develop I that? Do by hearing and reading, by hearing about Krishna's glories and pastimes and by listening. Okay. It, that may help, hearing the scriptures, yes. Navabhida Bhakti Maharaj. Mm -hmm. What did you say? I'm not hearing you. Navanida Bhakti Maharaj. Navanida Bhakti. No. Nine types of devotional service, Maharaj. Nava Anga Bhakti. Okay. Yeah, so, but I want you to know specifically which one will be particularly useful to help us to cultivate fearlessness. Doing our activities without attachment to the self. What activity? I want to know what activity. You say without attachment. That, that's theoretical. When we are preaching, when we are preaching, Maharaj. Hmm? When we are preaching, Maharaj. Chanting and associate the satsanga, go inside listening the Krishna Gada. No, but the sannyasi is going alone. He's going alone, like Prabhupada went to America alone. There's no sangha. Fearlessness, you go alone. Maharaj is a guru person. Huh? Believing in the instructions of the guru and spiritual work. No, yeah, that's but that's an inter. But there's there's got to be. All those negative thoughts. Maharaj, also sometimes uh, you have to preach like sannyasis. Mainly they have to preach to grihasthas. Uh, they might have to do it in a palatable way, but still they have to preach what is there in the scriptures. So sometimes it is a quality of fearlessness because you're taking a risk. Uh, whatever you say might not be comfortable or palatable to the person who's hearing. Okay. But, uh, so you say they have to go out and they have to do preaching work. Okay. Always be engrossed in thoughts of Lord. Okay. But how do you think of the Lord? I want to know how you do that. Maharaj, can, yeah. I, can, can we do, can we um, read and sing the bhajans of our acharyas? Okay. You, you could do that. You could do kirtan. Let's go on, let's go on because you know, you're not sannyasi, so you don't really need to cultivate that quality of fearlessness. <laughs> let's talk about some of the other qualities. Now purification of one's existence, that's also for sannyasis, really. And cultivation of spiritual knowledge, that's especially meant for the sannyasis. Sannyasi, they should, they should study a lot, they should do a lot of hearing, and chanting and remembering Krishna, right? Remembering Krishna comes about the more we hear and chant. What about, chari what about charity? How can we apply that in our devotional service? How will you do it? Uh, we can use our uh, little bit of our income, uh, keep it separately for the service of the Lord or for giving charity to the temples for the Eastern temples. Okay. Using it for prashadam and preaching. Okay, very good. Yeah. You like to support the programs? 
yeah? You can donate to the temple. And if somebody doesn't have any money, can they give charity? They, they, they should go themselves to serve the Lord. Right. Completely. Yeah, they should do voluntary service. And they can do also kids. Yes. yes. If somebody don't have money, even he can he can uh, donate by mind also sometimes. You know, if really he don't have money, you know, and yeah, but there's active service he can do. It's not that they can just think, oh, I'm doing it in the mind, Prabhu. You know, they can do, they can engage their body in the service of Krishna. We shouldn't, you know, we don't want to give people excuse because people will say, oh, I'm in my, in my mind, Prabhu, I'm serving. <laughs> you know, I think that's a, a very risky thing, kind of thing. <laughs> Better we get them to do something fit, actual, actual Okay, and then Maharaj, I think we should go for a simple living and high thinking principle. So we should, we should live simply so that we can save uh, more money and then uh, we, we can uh, donate for, uh, whatever money we can save. Oh, okay. That's a very great sacrifice of you. Okay. What about non-violence? No, let's go on. Non-violence. How are you going to cultivate non-violence? By not eating, the, not eating meat. Also yeah. not hurting people. Right. We don't... Violence is depriving people of the goal of life. If we don't give them Krishna consciousness, it's violence. So non-violence is to give people spiritual knowledge. So preaching, preaching work is required. What about truthfulness? Yes? Uh, Shastra Shila Prabhupada, a real non-violence is to make people Krishna conscious. If this Krishna consciousness to people is a real non-violence. Yes, we said so that. I, I just uh, said that. I just covered that. I mentioned that. I said we have to preach. Yeah. I want I want to go on. non uh, After non-violence. Next one. Uh, truthfulness. Maybe somebody's doing business. <laughs> Maybe to be engaged in a profession uh, which does not require you to break regulated principles or does not require you to cheat or uh, really lie per se. Yes, actually it's, it's be better to avoid. Yeah? And even while, Maharaj, even while preaching we don't distort the truth of the authorities or the Vedic uh, literature and don't break the information. Okay. All right, very nice. Yeah. We don't transparent to our spiritual master. Truthfulness is destroyed by gambling. So we definitely don't want to gamble. We don't want to, you know, get involved in speculative things. Just simply live, sim live peacefully, honestly. What about freedom from anger? How can we cultivate this? Yeah. Doing devotional service itself, practicing uh, devotional service can help in uh, getting rid of anger. Yeah, I mean, first yeah. things will be chanting. I would say chanting in meditation, and next would be association and surrendering to Lord. Yes, good chanting will definitely help <laughs> us to control the mind, and we we Not need expecting any honor from others. Well, we need to also study the, the scriptures and understand how, where anger is coming from, how anger is coming from the lust, and the lust is coming from our desire to enjoy the material world. And so we have to understand the nature of this anger, where, it, where its roots are, and we have to be very careful to avoid it and uproot it. And so cultivating the spiritual understanding is very important. What about modesty? Or modesty is like being without yeah. Actions by associating with devotees. 
can help us in um, well you can life. you you can be very proud in association with devotees you know you could be with devotees and you can you may not be modest at all you may be very proud just the opposite of modest so, it's not just associating with devotees you have to do something else you know because you may be Hearing and reading about the great devotees of the Lord, like Pralad Maharaj and Dhu Maharaj. Uh huh. One thing we could do is make a a habit, make a a, a, a a habit to offer respectful obeisances to devotees whenever we meet them. To develop that culture that we come, we meet people, we offer, we say, please accept my humble obeisances. Develop that. Habit, you know, amanena manadena, right? Offering all respects to others and not being anxious for respect ourselves. So that kind of thing. Being willing to bow down to other, to recognize other people as devotees and respecting them. By, by, and by serving them also, by doing service for the devotees. It's not just association with devotees, but it's how we associate. So if we become the servant, we think of ourselves as the servant of the other devotees, then that's very good. What about forgiveness? Are you good at forgiving people? How do you, yeah, forgiving people, you know, somebody does something to you, and they say something you didn't like, or you're not pleased with it, you have some problem with them, how can you forgive them? You may be left out of some, yeah? Yeah, we can believe in the universal brotherhood, you know, that Krishna is the, our ultimate father, and all are Krishna's uh, uh, sons, you know, so we are brothers. So in that sense, when we when we think in that way, I think we can automatically forgive others. Well, how do we behave in that way as a brother? You know, you talk I like that. How? We have but, to be equipoised, Maharaj. Huh? We have to be equipoised in all. Uh, well, that situation. that's another quality. <laughs> that's a whole. Not Maharaj, uh, if you are able to rise above the bodily consciousness. And feel that we are the soul. How to do? How to do? If any slight is done, it is done to the body, not to the soul. So how do we, how do we do that then? Also by thinking, Maharaj, that um, whatever if I if I'm in a com uncomfortable situation, this is for my purification. Mm. Uncomfortable situation. Yes, I mean ref that's reflection, you know, but. Uh, we're trying to apply these principles to devotional service because Prabhupada is saying that if we just simply do devotional service, all the good qualities will come about. So looking at these different qualities, if we think which particular kind of devotional service do I need to do to cultivate this quality? So forgiveness, we could say, Again, servitude, being the servant, being a humble servant, because maybe we, we're, we're, we haven't got the courage to ask them to forgive us. So how do we show, you know, some appreciation and respect for others and that we recognize them? Just simply by serving them. So the, the service mood, being the servant, that is also one of the limbs of devotional service. Hmm? Forgiveness, it's a difficult thing to do, <laughs> to forgive people. Another just one question about forgiveness. Uh -huh. um, if, if we don't have a family of devotees, like our family, like parents and everything, and still we go on preaching to them uh, time after time, is that also a virtue of forgiveness? Uh, <laughs> well, it might be, yeah. I mean, 
Do you have anything to forgive them for? I mean, they're not devotees. It, you know, in some ways it, it's not their fault. You know, they're your family. You know, you raised them, your children like that. You know, I mean, you should, you, you're responsible. It's not their fault. I don't... Yeah, but the fact that they don't appreciate that you are in devotional service and yet you go on, whenever uh, you get an opportunity, you try to preach to them. Well, you have to be careful about that, trying to preach to people, particularly in your home. You know, that they're, they, they see you. You, you, have, you, have to, you have to rather preach to them by your example, not so much by your words, by your own behavior, by your own sense control and your own freedom from anger and your own pleasure in life. You should impress them. You should be able to convince them that you've improved as a person. It's not that you have to teach them all the time, because they get tired of hearing you tell them what you want, what, what you think you, they should be doing. And, you know, you have to show them the example. We say example speaks louder than words. But if you go on all the time to them, oh, you should be a devotee, devotees that do this, and that, you know, they'll get tired of that. They'll never become devotees. But if they see the, the right example, if you impress them with your, your behavior, your happiness and joy in life, then they can be convinced that, oh, this Krishna consciousness must be something very good. So you have to be a bit careful about uh, yes. trying to convince them, you know, trying or thinking that you have to forgive them. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Okay, so the main point in this exercise, we want you to understand that if we cultivate devotional service, just simply by doing devotional service, the nine angas, these different qualities will all come about, one after another. Hmm? So Prabhupada discusses each of the qualities in the purport. And we may think, oh, so many qualities, I have to do this one, I have to do that one. No, you just have to be a devotee. You just have to be a devotee and it comes about naturally. And then, uh, let me just close this here. Uh, yeah, Prabhupada, uh, in the purport, he talks about the word abhijatashya, right? Abhijatashya. He's saying one should be born, one can be born with the quality. Where is it? Uh, right, here's the 26 qualities. That's a demonic quality. You can see that the demons coming in the next verse, these six qualities of the demon, the demonic nature. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, ignorance. This is the demonic nature. And then later on in the chapter, Krishna will also speak about lust, anger and greed. So, in both section, in both the divine and the demoniac qualities, Lord Krishna uses the word abhijatashya. Prabhupada explains, the word abhijatashya, in reference to one born of transcendental qualities or godly tendencies, is very significant. Right? We're born from birth, from the womb, from the time we come in the womb, we have certain qualities. It's not by chance someone is godly and someone is demoniac. It's not by chance. Prabhupada explains, to beget a child in a godly atmosphere is known in the Vedic scripture as Garbhodan Samskar. If the parents want a child in the godly qualities, they should follow 
10 principles recommended for the social life of the human being. Have you all heard of this, the 10 principles for social life? Anybody? Have you heard of the 10 principles? No, the, Prabhupada is talking about the sam, samskars, samskars, pu, purificatory activities which help for the progress of the soul. And the first, the first samskar which is meant to be done is the garbhadan samskar at the time of conceiving a child. And then while the child is in the womb, there's another samskar, and then with the birth, there's another samskar, and then there's the first grain giving when the child is six months. That's a very popular samskar, anaprashna, right? That's a samskar. And when the child begins education, there's another samskar. And when the child gets, when the child grows up, gets married, then it's also samskar. And then death also, samskar. So these are the ten purificatory, ten principles recommended for the social life. And these samskars, they help so much to develop the qualities of the person, the soul. You want to attract a good soul, there's a process. In the same way, people don't care they don't follow any rules and regulations. So what kind of child do you expect them to get? They're not going to get a very devoted, very godly ch child if they do everything the wrong way. It's like that. It's a science. It's a science. Producing good quality children, there's a science. People don't know. The people today, they're in ignorance about this. We want to have good quality children. It's so important. So Prabhupada is explaining all of these things to us. Okay, so Arjuna heard also that the, the, there's a divine qualities, people are born with them, and there's also the demonic qualities. The, the demons are also born with the demonic qualities. Prabhupada writes, in verse number 4 purport, these demoniac qualities are taken on by them from the beginning of their bodies in the wombs of their mothers. And as they grow, they manifest all these inauspicious qualities. Right? <laughs> so, uh, so Arjuna may be worried that maybe he's a demon because, you know, he's going to use anger and harshness, he has to fight. So Arjuna may be worried that he also has demonic qualities. But Lord Krishna tells him, don't worry, O son of Pandu, you are born with the divine qualities. Why is that? How does, how can Krishna say this, that Arjuna is born with the divine qualities? What's the justification there? He confirms that um, he's born Kunti is a devotee. Well, yeah, she's a devotee, but uh, and and when she when she uh, uh, gets the child from Indra, uh, it by the mantra, uh, which may be maybe said as the uh, samskara. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. But, but Maharaj, because Arjun has surrendered to Lord Krishna and he is asking Lord Krishna to help him. This itself shows that he has divine qualities. Right. Arjuna is not rushing in there thinking, I'm going to fight, I'm going to kill these guys, I'm going to get them. You know, they did so many bad things, so many injustices to us. No, Arjuna is hesitant to go into the battle. So that's the sign of his divine quality, that he's very thoughtful, he's considering, am I doing the right thing? He wants to know and he's asking Krishna, what, is this right? You should tell me Krishna, what, is this right, what I'm doing? He wants to be guided. Actually Arjuna is thinking he didn't want to fight, 
but Krishna convinced him that he should fight. So that's a sign of Arjuna's good quality. Yeah. Now, Maharaj, I have a doubt. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj. Yeah. The, 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 the slide before, people were saying that there are ten uh, principles, but uh, which are samskaras. Nothing but ten. The principles are prasamskaras. Yes. So, but uh, there are sixteen prasamskaras now. But Maharaj is uh, saying only ten. Why not the other six are considered? Oh, I don't know, Prabhu. I only know ten. Really, there's sixteen samskars, are there? But here Prabhupada talks about ten principles recommended for the social life of the human being. Uh, Maharaj, I have the book, the samskaras. I'm just checking. The ten uh, here refers to Vaishnava samskaras. Uh, probably Prabhupada meant the Vaishnava samskaras. Uh -huh. Right. These are the ten samskaras. Here it is mentioned in this book. Right. Yeah, These yeah. are called the Vaishnava sams samskaras. Cut cutting the hair and things like that. Yeah. The first hair cutting, yes. the first ah. grain feeding. These are samskaras. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So. So, okay, coming back to this, uh, verse number 5, in verse number five, Lord Krishna is saying, In this world there are two kinds of created beings. One is called the divine and the other demoniac. I have already explained to you at length the divine qualities, now hear from me of the demoniac. Now, it's interesting when presented, sometimes people say, why only two? <laughs> they, you know, Krishna is saying only two natures, divine, demoniac. The problem is, you see, if we're not divine, then we come in the demoniac category. And people get a bit upset to think that they're, de that they're a demon. <laughs> Right? We don't like to be a demon. It's not very pleasant. We like to be godly, but at the same time it's difficult for us to be godly. That sometimes we're overwhelmed by the situation and we fall into the mode of passion and it may even become the mode of ignorance. And sometimes that demoniac nature does come out from us, right? The, what were the qualities again? The, the demoniac nature? Anger. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These things. So, we're going to look, the rest of the chapter is discussing this demoniac nature. We want to hear about it and recognize it, understand how it affects people, how they behave. But Krishna says there's only two natures. Some people say, oh no, there should be one in between, there should be something. <laughs> but it, it's not what Krishna says. Krishna said one or the other, what way are we going to go? So Arjuna is fortunate, he had a good birth and he's associating with Lord Krishna, he has divine qualities, right? His involvement in the fight was not demoniac because he was considering sorry, the... Sorry, sorry Maharaj, can you please tell again where are we, which, 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 which uh, paragraph we are reading, please? Maharaj, yeah. I'm sorry. This is the purport of verse number 5. Verse number 5. Yeah. Right. There's only one paragraph. His involvement in the fight. Uh, uh, you should be able to see it on the screen. Can you see the screen? No, there's no screen. Yes, Maharaj, we can see the screen. Okay. 
So his involvement in the fight was not demoniac because he was considering the pros and cons, not acting under the influence of anger, false prestige or harshness. So this is devotee. This is not demoniac nature. He didn't have the demoniac mentality. Okay? Going ahead. In this world there are two kinds of created beings. One is called divine, the other demoniac. Now, sometimes we may display the divine qualities and other times we may display the other side, the, 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 the demoniac. We, the demon can become a devotee. That is the point. That these demoniac, this demoniac nature, these demonic tendencies, they can be removed by proper understanding and by practice, being becoming being made aware that this is not proper behavior, this is not the proper understanding. We have to recognize this demoniac mentality then we can overcome it. Now what makes the difference? What makes the difference between the devotee and the demon? Would anyone like to suggest what's the difference? Uh, Maharaj, uh, the devotee um, may follow the uh, spiritual master's uh, teaching and uh, word or may follow as per the Vedic injunction. Right. Follow the principles, so he, he becomes uh, a devotee. Right. It's based on who's following the scriptures. The, those who are demoniac, they don't care what the scriptures say. They don't listen to spiritual authority. But the devotees, the godly people, they do. You know, these other people, this demon, that they eat anything, they say anything, do all kinds of things. They don't care. They don't care what the scriptures say. They don't care. They don't believe in karma. They don't believe in life after death, like that. And so two kinds of people. Prabhupada explains, so they do not like people in divine nature. Prabhupada's talking here, giving an example of the demonic nature, you see. They, those who are demonic, they don't like the devotee, they don't like this divine nature. And Prabhupada goes on to say, they will tolerate all kinds of noise, the barking of the dogs, the motor car passing, the aeroplane overhead. But as soon as there is kirtan, they're disturbed. They'll tolerate so many different types of noise, but they'll not tolerate Kirtan. Prabhupada continues, in the morning at seven o'clock, not very early, we used to hold our class and there was little sound. Immediately the tenants from upward, they'll come down and complain. Sometimes they will call for police and on the street, 2nd Avenue, New York City, there is always big, big trucks and motor cars going, heavy sound. Then in your country, the garbage carrier sound, that digging sound, so many sounds they'll tolerate. And as soon, Hare Krishna, oh, it's unbearable. This is demonic. <laughs> So Prabhupada had these kind of experiences, he saw the tendency in the Western society, how strong the demonic nature is there, very difficult. Prabhupada continued, so they do not like people in, oh, no, no we read that, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so this is demonia. Here's the, the sections of the chapter, the first six verses describing the qualities. 
Then verse 7 to 18 will describe the actual nature of the demon and then the results of demonic activities. <laughs> oh, we're not going to do that. We don't have any newspapers for you. But maybe just from your own experience, you might, write, you might be able to reflect on some kind of uh, divine quality. What would be a, a good example, something in the news about the divine nature? And anyone can think of something? Yes, especially at this time when the when there's a, you know the, the 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 virus going around, but the the devotees are taking the risk, r risking their own health to go out and distribute food to people because there are people in need. There's a lot of hungry people these days because so many countries have been shut down and they have people have no means of income. Usually they just live from one day to the other and so the devotees are taking some initiative there to try to distribute food for these hungry people, try to help them, even at the risk of their own health. I heard devotees in Bangladesh, they got a problem, something like 30 of them or more, they got the, the virus because they are doing food distribution there in Dhaka. So, yes, that's a good example, Devi Sampat, helping for others. What about Asuric Sampat? Maharaj, probably the news where the, the sadhus are being killed, which has, which, has become twice, which has been twice in the papers. Oh, what is this? Sadhus have been killed where? Uh, more clinching news that had been there in a couple of places, one in Maharashtra and one in why, why have they been killed? Uh, while there is no uh, confirmed uh, reason for it, but the, the news around it is because of the Christian missionaries which are prominent in those areas. So when the sadhus are around there, so that, that is the kind of, uh, what you say, kind of news that is around. But oh. nothing, nothing has been confirmed or it has been put formally on the paper. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Uh, the these politicians they are uh, they are exploiting the society, so they have human uh, qualities. Yeah. Can you give an example how they are exploiting though? Exploiting by by introducing laws which are uh, not favorable to the citizens. Uh huh. Like in West Bengal, you know, all these things are happening. They are against uh, this uh, uh, Indian uh, Indian people. They're against Indian people in Bengal. No, the government government is uh, introducing laws which is against India. Oh. Maharaj, another thing is. Uh, the current government is trying to introduce the Bhagavad Gita as one of the curriculum in the school, but the oppositions are op uh, opposing for this uh, uh, because of, you know, that may be a demonic nature. Yes. Krishna, somebody's uh, uh, unmuted. Building can't. Please mute yourself. Uh, others, please mute your mics. Lot of disturbance. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Also, uh, one of the case we can take, like the politicians uh, ruling the uh, general mass without keeping the scriptures in between, Krishna in between. Before the, uh, the, the, king, the kings used to rule the kingdom by taking the uh, uh, you know, uh, 
brahmanas into consideration and following the scriptures nowadays when the politicians are ruling the country they are uh, ruling for their own benefits and for the sense gratification is kept the center not the lord okay good or not self realization uh huh yeah the, and there's a lot of asuric qualities in the modern world today you know and some years ago in america maharaj they are encouraging cow slaughter yes slaughter houses yeah that's a big big uh, demonic quality yeah slaughter houses and then uh, even the ad even the advertisements maharaj that we see on uh, tv they are all promoting the uh, illicit things like alcohol and cigarettes and yes which are very contrary to the vedic principles right that's also demonic right they advertise all this intoxication promote all the sinful activities uh, are you familiar with this term ugra karma ugra karma is described in verse number 9 if you look ahead text number 9 talking about ugra karma ugra karma means horrible works the text number 9 the demonic who are lost to themselves and who have no intelligence engage in unbeneficial horrible works meant to destroy the world have you heard of these kind of things they do things meant to destroy the world but they they claim that, you know they're doing things which just ruining the world and we can see uh, the examples prabhupa gives some examples he talks about nuclear weapons atom bombs atomic generators using nuclear power and they produce waste when they when they used uh, atomic generators they have they have radioact they have radioactive waste they don't know what to do with it so they put it in the ocean they say it will be okay there in the bottom of the ocean for 30 years let other people worry about it after 30 years so this is ugra karma very demoniac they don't care they think oh well, just put it in the bottom of the sea other people will take care of it and then we do things like uh cut down the forests and big slot to build big slaughter houses the government spend a lot of money to promote uh, birth control using contraception and different birth control devices it's all demonic and ogra karma they spend a lot of money like they built a, they built a road between england and france they built the road under the sea so very, so much labor so much trouble they went to to build a road under the sea you know they can take the boat across the sea but they got in so much trouble they spent fortune just to put the road under the sea and similarly spent sent spaceships up into the they say going to higher planets going to the moon or something So so many activities are going on in the material world they're really horrible. We'll just quickly look at them. Let me Yes. This Ugra karma have doubt. Ugra karma means it is the it is the trouble given to the public or the sins committed on the personal level. What is Ugra karma or doubt? Oh, yeah it's giving trouble to the whole planet to everybody to all uh, the, the people who are committing the sins on the personal basis like uh, cut, having uh, illicit sex connection or uh, having enmity uh, like this the the very uh, personal sins uh, is is it doesn't come under ugra karma or how or it is only sins 
No, ugra karma is much bigger than that. We're not talking about individual sins. We're talking about the whole nation's sins, about the whole, you know, the whole society committing the, some, some kind of, engaging in some kind of sinful propaganda work. Just like uh, Prabhupada talks here, you know, uh, and if you look at the purport of text number nine, Prabhupada says in the purport, halfway through, they have no idea how to behave towards one another. Animal killing is very uh, prominent amongst demonic people. Such people are considered the enemies of the world because ultimately they will they will invent or create something which will bring destruction to all. Indirectly, this verse anticipates the invention of nuclear weapons, of which the whole world is today very proud. At any moment, war may take place, and these atomic weapons may create havoc. Such things are created solely for the destruction of the world, and that is indicated here. Due to godlessness, such weapons are invented in human society. They are not meant for the peace and prosperity of the world. Right? Is it clearer now what, what Prabhupada means when we talk about Ugra Karma? Yamaraj. Yamaraj is clear. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Can I ask a question? Maharaj, as these things are going on, now, uh, is there any, any kind of solution we can see or any, anything devotees can do on these things? Uh, well, devotees can be an example to others. We can show people the good example of living in the mode of goodness living simply, living honestly, working peacefully and happily, keeping your family together, raising them to be honest, God-conscious people, just by showing an example to others. That's what devotees can do. Unless you're, you know, ha unless you happen to be a world, a world statesman or, a, you know, a very big uh, politician or something, then maybe you could do a bit more. But if we're just ordinary people, common people, you know, the working class, and we just try to show a good example to others. Is it clear? Thank you. Let's look at some of the other verses. A very important one, verse number 7. Verse number 7 talks about uh, those who are demonic, do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Neither cleanliness nor proper behavior nor truth is found in them. Huh? The verse be Pavritim Cha Nivritim Cha Jana Navadura Suraha. Right? Pavriti and Nivriti. Prabhupada gave a very nice lecture on this point when he was in one of the ISKCON temples and Prabhupada talked about the purpose of ISKCON is to change the pavriti and the nivriti. And Prabhupada explained to the, the devotees, he said, before becoming devotees, you know, our, before being a devotee we had a very different idea about what we would do and what we would not do. Pavriti means the things we're going to do and nevriti the things we're not going to do. So before being devotees, the devotees, they didn't follow any regulated principles. They would eat without any discrimination, they would engage in all kinds of sinful activities, taking intoxication and so on. But after becoming devotee, then it's a different world, it's a whole different change. Then very conscious. Oh, no, no, the devotee will say, I'm sorry, I don't eat that. I'm sorry, I don't go to cinema. I'm sorry, I don't read these magazines. I don't look at these kind of, you know, 
glossy literatures, I don't waste my time. No, it's a very, de the devotee's consciousness changed. So this is the purpose of the Krishna consciousness movement, to change the pavriti and the nivriti, to get people to know what is the proper standard for society. Yeah? In the, in the purport to that verse, number seven, Prabhupada says, As for behavior, there are many rules and regulations guarding human behavior, such as the Manu Samhita, which is the law book for human race. Even up to today, those who are Hindu follow the Manu Samhita, laws of mankind laws of inheritance and other, uh, and other legalized are, are derived from this book. Now in the Manu Samhita it is clearly stated that a woman should not be given freedom. This does not mean that women are to be kept as slaves, but they are like children. Children are not given freedom. But that does not mean that they are kept as slaves. The demons have now neg neglected such injunctions and they think that women should be given as much freedom as men. However, this has not improved the social conditions of the world. Actually, a woman should be given protection of uh, protection at every stage of her life. Okay, so, of course, quite a controversial point, but Prabhupada was not afraid of controversy. And Prabhupada went to America at the times in the 1970s, there was a women's liberation movement. And people would come, they would often come and challenge Prabhupada about this. <laughs> but Prabhupada would just simply state the facts that women should be protected. Are women better off now that they go out to work? The children have to bring themselves up. The children don't have their parents at home. The father's out to work, mother's also out to work. Nobody at home. It's a very different environment from how things used to be. It used to be the mother would always be at home. But nowadays, working women, the mother's gone out to work. You go to educational institutes and you see also so many ladies there. All the women, they're studying engineering and building, construction, architecture. And they study all of these things. Not exactly ideal for women to do all of these things. So Prabhupada's explaining the traditional culture, that traditionally women would be looked after, they would be protected. Are women any better off now than they were before? You can say, well, now they're driving their car. Now they're earning for themselves. But they pay the price. They pay the price that their home life suffers. We see how much more the divorce rate has increased because of women going out to work. Okay. So, we'll go ahead. Text number eight, another powerful verse. Uh, Text number eight describes the demonic nature. Asatyam apratishtam te jagadahur aneshwaram. This is the demonic mentality. They say the world is unreal, with no foundation, no God in control. They say it is produced of sex desire and has no cause other than lust. Well, this is, is very common, you know. They say there's no God, the world is unreal. They say, it's, 
it's just meant for, for the last. Some of the devotees, uh, I know some. Hare Krishna. Are we back? Atheist society, and when the devotees come for their program, then the atheists are all there, they have their program, and they have to use the same facilities. So the atheists, they see the devotees coming and they ridicule the devotees, they see them chanting and so on, and they think, oh, look at these people, you know, and they believe in this God, and, and they're laughing, because they're atheists. They believe, they, they have, they're promoting their atheistic philosophy. Why are people atheists? There's, there was one f famous man in, in England who wrote a book about confessions of an atheist. He said, if I was to believe in God, then I would be forced to behave better than I do and to avoid all the sinful activities which I do. So that's the real reason. People just want to engage in their sinful activities and sense, have sense gratification. And they think they won't have to answer for it at the time of death. So this is demoniac. No God in control. They're thinking like... There's no accountability, so they like it, you know, nobody to control them. So right. they're free to do whatever they want, Maharaj. Yeah. Mm. So, the devotees are, get, get, we're guided by the scriptures, but, you know, they don't believe in any scripture, they don't believe in anything. What do they believe in? They just believe in, in money and sense gratification and all their sinful life. And the, okay, so... The, the demonic nature is described very powerfully in that verse there. 
So the aim of the, the demonic people, they simply want to cultivate their uh, materialistic sense gratification, all their plans for enjoying the world, sense gratification. So here's, uh, where's our slide? Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Results of the demonic philosophy. Describe text number 19. Those who are envious, mischievous, who are the lowest among men, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence in various demonic species of life. Here's some pictures of the demonic species of life. <laughs> you can see. You can see. Not very pleasant looking creatures, are they? This is it. You know, these are all souls, pure souls. And they're put into these different demonic species of life. And this, why? This is what they desire. They actually desire to have bodies like that. So they're described, they're Nara Dhamma, lowest of men. And Krishna says, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence. Meaning birth after birth, they take these different bodies. They're entering in these different bodies, birth after birth. So, is this cruel of Krishna to do this to them? Is this fair that Krishna does this? Actually, this is what they the, desire. Yes, their desire, right. That's just what they want. They want this. They want to have these nasty bodies like this. And so they, they have to suffer. Well, they, of course, they, they, but they don't think they're suffering. They're actually thinking they're happy. And even in these kind of bodies, they're thinking they're happy. They're thinking they're enjoying life. So this is how the material nature works on all these different living entities. Put them into different demoniac species of life, birth after birth. Prabhupada's purport says, In material existence, we find so many species of life, animals, insects, men, and so on. All are arranged by the superior power. They are not accidental. As for the demoniac, it is clearly said here that they are perpetually put into the wombs of demons. Thus they continue to be envious, the lowest of mankind. Now, th this is their desire. Man proposes, God disposes. We get these kind of bodies, the result of our mentality, a result of our consciousness. So people have this nature to be very envious, very nasty to others, so they take these kinds of bodies. So Maharaj, I have a question in, in reference to this. So so now let's say anyone who's envious, who, who does not follow any uh, devotional service or maybe who do, who do not follow the scriptures, let's say from other dharma also, so does it mean that they're going to take these bodies? Well, it depends a lot on their attitude. Are they really envious and, you know, very nasty and very pr uh, conceited and proud like that? Do they have that? What is their particular, how, how demonic are they? There's different degrees of demons, you know. You have big demons like Kamsa and Sishupala. Krishna comes and personally kills them. You know, you have these big, very powerful demons, Agasura and Pondraka, these kind of people fighting with Krishna and trying to kill Krishna. And you have little demons, people who are just, and you've got people who are just, they just don't care. They're just apathetic. They just, 
Oh, I, I don't care, I, you know, I don't think about it, I just do my work, I just want to make some money, I just want to be able to eat and sleep. You know, they don't think about things like that. You know, they're not particularly demoniac, but they're not devotee. They, they, you know, they're just interested in material life. Their life is just centered around the home and eating and sleeping. Okay, you know. They're not devotees, but that's demonic. But they're not big demons. But some people are particularly demoniac. You know, they're particularly nasty and envious, and they make a business out of attacking others and criticizing them. Then you've got people who create false philosophies. They have their own atheistic propaganda. You know, one will say that we're all God, why should you worship God, we are all the God. Or they will say there's no God, it's all by chance. You know, and so many different bogus philosophies are being propagated. So that's re really demoniac, because you're spreading your atheistic philosophy to other people. You're influencing the minds of others by your propaganda, by your demoniac propaganda. That's very nasty and envious. Yeah, for example, someone gave a reference in terms of where sadhus were killed uh, maybe this week or something. So that's one of the... Yes. That's one of the examples, yeah. Another thing is another very... The people, you know, known people, some they are uh, following like regulative principle, means uh, no uh, illicit sex, no gambling, no uh, liquor and all. And they are not actually Krishna conscious people, but they are worshipping demigods. So they do all in you know, charity, humble, all so many qualities are they are carrying. What category they are committed to? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, they're on they're on the Vedic path, right? Because they're worshipping the demigods, that's, that's approved by the Vedic culture, worshipping worshiping the demigods. And the, gradually, by worshipping demigods, they'll come to understand, just like in Bhagavad Gita, it says those who worship demigods, their results are limited and temporary. And so gradually, these people who are worshipping the demigods, they'll be made aware that the results of the worship are limited and temporary. They're not going to get the ultimate, real, highest benefit just by worshipping demigods. And so then, if they're fortunate, they'll be guided to worship, to find out something higher than the demigods, who the demigods also worship. Someone who is above the demigods, who is controlling even the demigods. Above the demigods, there's the Supreme Lord Himself. So, you have to, uh, we have to see, you know, what is their actual nature. Are they really out and out against the, su the Supreme Lord, or having a Supreme Lord, one Supreme Being? Or are they just, maybe they just didn't know, they just haven't thought about it very much. So like that, you know, they can be elevated, they can be brought to the higher platform. Definitely. Krishna says, those whose, those whose minds are distorted by material desires worship the demigods. So these material desires, they come in the mind, you know, and eventually we hope if they get association with a devotee, they can be brought to a higher consciousness, a higher awareness and worship the Supreme Lord. So it, it takes the mercy of a devotee to bring people to Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I just uh, interject with a question? Oh, yes, that? please do. Maharaj, what about those uh, so-called devotees who are worshippers of Kali, used for, um, and not engage themselves in tantric and uh, killing? Um, what do we classify? Are they 
devotees of Amase Kolar are they considered as devotees or they are of the demoniac nature but worshipping Kali? Well, the, we'll be looking at that in the next class. It's coming up in the next chapter. Okay. And we're going to talk about different kinds of Sorry. faith. Yeah? It's going to, so that will be discussed in the next okay. chapter, the divisions of faith. And we'll see how people, diff people in different modes of nature, how they're worshipping. Right. It's, we have to consider like that, you see. It's, it's according to the modes of nature. Somebody is worshipping in the mode of goodness, somebody is worshipping in passion, and somebody is worshipping in ignorance. Just like the Puranas, there are different Puranas. There are Puranas for people in goodness and in passion and in ignorance. So different instructions and different principles for different people according to the situation in the modes of nature. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Did any Thank other, you. anybody else had a question there? Okay, we can go ahead. So you can see here on the on the screen, text number twenty-one. Trividam narakashyaidam dwarana nasana nasana atmana. Right? The three gates leading to hell. Kama Krodas Tatalobas. Tasmadita Traya Jagat. Right? We have to avoid them. They lead to the degradation of the soul. And in the purport, he writes, he said, these three things, lust, anger, and greed, this is the beginning of demoniac life. Of course, we know that anger can also be used in the service of Krishna. And greed, one may be greedy for devotional service. And the gopis, they had lust for Krishna. <laughs> so these things can also be in Krishna consciousness. But generally, in the case of the conditioned souls, lust, anger and greed mean demoniac life. Lust, the desire for something, to enjoy, to get something. And when we don't get it, we become angry. And when we do get it, we want more. We become greedy for more. So we have to be very con conscious and careful to control these things. You covered this earlier in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna had described the lust, the all-devouring sinful enemy of man, right? Never satisfied, burns like fire. How to control it? How do we conquer over lust? Do you remember? Anyone? Do you... Uh, uh, detachment process, Maharaj? Well, no, not exactly. Attachment to Krishna? Using intelligence, Maharaj? Huh? Using intelligence? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to know what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. What does Krishna say? How to conquer over this lust? How does he tell Arjun? Which chapter is it in? Arjuna asks a question. Why do we chapter do three. sinful... Chapter 3. Okay. Uh, he says, um, yeah... Uh, to everyone should do their duty. Tat, tat, no, um, uh, to ask for that. You know, it's all. Uh, so, Maharaj, is that the verse where if they do their duty properly, then you can conquer the lust? Well, that I don't remember that as being the answer. When. Krishna, Krishna speaks about regulating the senses. Regulating the senses is very important. Because our senses are not regulated, that's why we get lust to, to, 
You know, one day we sleep very late, another day we get up early, one day we eat a lot, next day we fast. You know, we're not regulated. We're not regulated. One day we chant, one day we don't chant so well. One day we chant in the morning, next day we chant at night. Oh, so much, so many irregularities. Now we have to regulate the senses and, and, and cultivate also spiritual knowledge. Armed with knowledge, stand and fight, right? The armed with knowledge, knowledge is our weapon to cut through this, this uh, lust, this attachment to sense gratification. So these things are stressed. If you look at the third chapter, at the end of the chapter there, Krishna describes the processes to conquer over that lust, slay this all-devouring sinful enemy, by, or curb it, curb it by regulating the senses. And so this is important for us. We want to cultivate the good qualities, Good qualities also require regulation, sense control. We were hearing the importance of sense control. So we need to try to, of course, in family life, we know household life, not so easy. Sometimes things will be topsy-turvy, unregulated. But as much as possible, you have to try to keep some regulation particularly in regard to spiritual practice, hearing and chanting should be regular. means every day you have to do some chanting and hearing. It will help us to overcome this lust. And the, from the lust comes the anger and the greed. And this is how we become demon, how we show all these demoniac qualities. This is how we go to hell. Mm -hmm. So, here's the point. We have to raise ourselves to the mode of goodness. Again, you can see the same point coming out in this final section of the Bhagavad Gita. From the purport, text number 24, Prabhupada writes, One has to raise himself at least to the mode of goodness before the path to understanding the Supreme Lord can be opened. Without raising oneself to the standard of the mode of goodness, one remains in ignorance and passion, which are the cause of demoniac life. You know, you want to understand, we want to understand Krishna, somebody said they wanted to see Krishna, we want to develop love for Krishna. First of all, we have to get out of the mode of ignorance and passion. We have to come up to the mode of goodness. Very important. And so long as we're in the mode of passion and ignorance, then from passion and ignorance comes lust and anger and greed, all these things, all these bad qualities will come. We associate with the lower modes, we'll cultivate the lower qualities. We have to come up to the higher mode, to that mode of goodness. Very important. How do we come up to the mode of goodness? Regulation. Eat Krishna Prasadam. Don't just eat anything and everything. Be regulated. Try not to eat heavy meal at night. You want to wake up in the morning fresh. If we eat heavy foods at night, you won't have a good night's rest and you'll wake up feeling bad. So devotees, we, we will eat in the daytime, not at night. Prabhupada would take very small thing at night, just usually a glass of milk. Sometimes he'd take a little bit of his puff rice, like that. Okay, so then taking bath also two, three times a day, that's also very good. Purify the mind, cleanliness, internal and external. So bathing twice a day, putting on fresh clothes, 
fresh cloth and chanting the holy name. Here's another quote. This is from 17th chapter. Without coming to the platform of Sattva Gun, nobody can advance in spiritual life. That is a fact. Just like nobody is allowed to enter the law college unless he is graduate. This restriction is there. What he will understand about law, he must be a graduate. So similarly, first of all, one has to come to the platform of Sattva Gun. Then spiritual knowledge begins. Right? Prabhupada was lecturing there in Hawaii, <laughs> Honolulu. So Honolulu, because it's, you know, that kind of place, it's a holiday place, there's beaches there, and there's a lot of strong sense gratification atmosphere there. So Prabhupada also could see the, the young people sitting before him, you know, the young people with their long hair and their golden coloured skin, who spend the day on the beach all day, probably not having proper jobs and just enjoying their loose manner, loose ways. So Prabhupada is explaining to them, very important, cultivate the mode of goodness, get free of passion and ignorance. And this example, the law college, very good example. In India, you know, you want to study law, you must be a graduate. Then you can understand law. But if you're not educated much, how you can understand law, how you can practice law, impossible. So this very important point, very instructive. Okay, so we went over the 16th chapter and we saw the connection with the previous chapter. We spoke about this abhijatashya in relation to developing divine demoniac qualities. This comes from birth, right? We're born with it. You, so you get a good birth. We want good quality children, very important. Then the good qualities can be manifest. We also spoke about the destination of those who develop demoniac nature with reference to Bhagavad Gita, verses 19 to 24. Oh, did we, I, oh, I, I didn't actually cover this very much, did I? Verse, oh, well, we did. We, that's the demonic, the demoniac persons, right? That they will take birth in the demoniac species, birth after birth, with no hope of deliverance. This is their situation. They're in these demonic bodies and they take birth after birth a dog, a pig, and, and like that, they come in these different species of life again and again, nasty creatures. And then Shastra Chaksus, if you surf the internet, you can see the news, different divine and demoniac natures being manifest from the current world affairs. Some people, World Health Organization, trying to help people, trying to give them, people trying to give good instruction. You know, I saw one, one lady was speaking the, the yesterday, one devotee lady, she was telling people about how to cope with being in isolation. You know, she said, you may be on your own. So, you know, call up people and learn to do some yoga or, do, you know, chant, do some mantra mantra chanting, get some good books to read, you know, and you won't feel so alone. Those people who are more demoniac, you know, they suffer much more. How can they manage without their alcohol, no bars to go to, and all of these things. <laughs> so, world affairs, Ugra karma, from the current society at large, Ugra karma. Uh, the ex people doing things like the, the genetically modified grains and seeds, that's another ugra karma thing. 
before the farmers could just use the same seed, they could use their seeds year after year. But the multinational companies come in with their Ugra Karma genet genetically modified things and they get the farmers to buy their genetically modified seeds and then the farmers become dependent on them and they have to pay so much money and many farmers they just go they, their businesses their farming is just ruined by these GM crops so this is also Ugra Karma and then drilling in the North Sea to get oil that's also Ugra Karma they go out into the middle of the ocean to drill in the middle of the ground to get the oil and then a fishing they, they don't just use fishing nets anymore they take bombs and they explode them in the sea and they catch all the fish that way Ugra Karma how they drain the milk from the cows how they have mechanisms, different mechanized system for taking every, every last drop of milk from the cow. And then when there's no more milk, then they kill the cow. That's Ugra Karma. Horrible things which really have serious effects on the whole nature of the world. Because we don't protect the cows, we're not taking care of the cows. Then it creates serious problems on the whole planet. This planet actually belongs to the cow. The deity of this earth planet is Bhumi. And so if we don't take care of the cows, we get problems. Here's the final quote from Prabhupada. So these godly characteristics are there. Either you practice yourself to come to the godly characteristics or there is a simple method. If you take to devotional service, all the godly qualities automatically come. This is the process. So in this age, to develop these godly qualities is very difficult. But if you take to Krishna consciousness by the simple method, by chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, then automatically you develop all the godly qualities, right? Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Do we have some more questions there? Yeah, Maharaj, uh, this lower species who are entangled, uh, now how, what is the way they, they get delivered? They also, one day they will get delivered, is that it? So how, how do they get delivered? How do they get delivered, these people in the demonic species of life? <laughs> they don't. They just take birth again and again in demonic species of life. They'll take birth again and again. Many, many births. We don't know how many births. But how do, we cannot deliver a demonic species. How do you give mercy to a demonic species of life? Maybe if you want, you can try giving them prasada, I don't know. But they're so demonic, they may not take it. You can chant the holy name, let them hear the maha mantra. But you, you see sometimes when you go for sankirtan, you see some dogs, they get very upset when we come chanting. They, they really don't like it. Some dogs, they don't worry about it. Some dogs even follow us. But you get some dogs, they get really angry, really nasty. They're really demonic. So, uh, how to deliver these demonic species? That takes, that's a, just the compassion of a devotee. The devotee has to think how to deliver them. Are you, maybe, like Vasudev Datta, he told Lord Chaitanya, let me take all the sinful reactions. I will stay here. Let them go back. So Lord Chaitanya was very pleased with that. Well, very nice. You want to let them go back? You, you will stay here. Lord Chaitanya praised Vasudev Datta. He said, you have won my heart. He was so happy that Vasudev Datta had that mood, that compassion, caring about others. Prabhupada called one devotee over 
One time there was a little insect on the table and Prabhupada said, you have to think how to give this insect Krishna consciousness. So devotee, we're meant to be compassionate, we're meant to think how to give, how to deliver these unfortunate souls which are in these demonic species of life. I don't know, it's, 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 our, our real business is to deliver the human species. You know, you could spend a long time trying to give benefit to the crocodile or the frog or, you know, or so many bad dogs. We have to work on the human beings. The human beings, they have at least, they, they have some chance to become civilized. They may be demoniac, there's a lot of them demoniac, but they can be changed. We have to think how to work on the human beings very difficult to try to elevate these other lower species of life. So particularly powerful, the holy name and prasadam. We try to distribute prasadam as much as we can and we give prasadam not only to the poor. Prabhupada didn't like the idea that we would just go and give food to the poor. He said, the rich also need prasadam. Rich people also need to get some piety. They need also the mercy of Krishna. So Prabhupada said, especially in India, you don't want to just only give food to the poor. You need to give to everyone. And the holy name, also very important. We have to give them the holy name. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, how to do unearth nimritti to progress in our devotional service? How to do? Unearth nimritti. Unearth nimritti. What is that, unearth nimritti? How to remove our anartha so that we can... Oh, anartha nivritti. Okay, anartha nivritti. I wondered what you were talking about. How to remove the anarthas from the heart? Well, that is the process of sadhana bhakti. If you do good sadhana, then you will gradually get rid of the anarthas. But it's going to take some time because anartha nivritti is, it's the most difficult stage of the cultivation of the Bhakti Kripa. You know, Shraddha, Ado Shraddha, Tata Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, they're very quick, very easy. But Anartha Nevriti, that's a difficult, that's a real difficult thing to get through. Takes some time. We have to do sadhana very carefully very intensely and then we can remove the anarthas. Right? And we also study what are these anarthas. Right? We have to be able to remove the weeds because we're doing the hearing and the chanting so that the, the creeper is growing but the weeds are also growing. And if we don't recognize what are the anarthas, we may mistake, we may pull out the bhakti creeper instead of the anartha creeper. So you have to, we have to be careful, we have to recognize what is, what are the anarthas, which ones are the anarthas, which one are the weeds and which one is the actual creeper of devotion. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, any other questions there? Maharaj, I have one question which is probably out of the context. Can I ask? Yes. Maharaj, uh, is it, uh, which is good or, or out of these two options? Chant and be happy or be happy and chant? <laughs> Well, they're both good, right? They're both chanting. 
We're both chanting Hare Krishna. Be happy and chant. Yes, devotees, when, we, when, we, when we're going to chant Hare Krishna, naturally we should be happy. We're known as the happy Krishnas. Happy, we're happy in chanting the holy name of Krishna. And when chant and be happy, the idea is chant first and then become happy. Yeah, maybe like that. For some people, they may, they may be a little unsure at the time and then they begin to chant. And they begin to chant, they become happy, right? And somebody else, he's happy in the beginning and he chants and he becomes more happier. So, not a problem. Some yes, some some Can I just add on, on point here, Maharaj? I mean, if, we are, if I am happy and I start chanting, then my chanting improves. I can do better chanting because I am happy. So the better chanting begets more happiness. And because of the more happiness, your ch uh, chanting becomes more better, you know? But in the other way, if I say that I'll chant and be happy, and then depending on the chanting quality, if it is good chanting, I will be happy. But if, I, if it is not good chanting, then I don't be happy, you know. So that's what happens to me. Because I have a, I always set a standard that this is my chanting standard. And I can never reach that. So if I cannot reach that my standard, then I, I don't feel happy. So that way, uh, that's a bit different. Okay, so you have a standard about, you know, but some people, you see, somebody may be happy. Why are they happy? You know, they may be happy that, oh, they've got the day off today, they don't need to go to work, they're happy, you know. <laughs> they, so somebody else is happy, they want, they made some money or something, you know. Uh, there's a different reasons why people are happy. Generally, you know, there's something behind it. Why is somebody happy? So, if your ha your happiness is by chanting, that you chanted nicely, so it made you you're happy that you did good chanting. Okay, that's very nice. But we have to chant, whether happy or not. We have to chant. We chant for the pleasure of Krishna. It's not for our pleasure. We don't chant just to make ourselves happy. We chant for Krishna to do service for Krishna. We want to please Krishna by our chanting. And we're chanting because also it's my duty to be faithful to the instruction of my spiritual master. Spiritual master asked us to chant every day. He told us we should chant 16 rounds a day at least. So it's our duty to chant. So we don't just chant for our own happiness, but that's a side effect which may come along with it. Just like when we do devotional service, we automatically get knowledge and detachment, all these things come. But we're doing devotional service, we want to serve, do the service for Krishna. The purpose is to please Krishna. Whatever else comes, that's not so important. There was one devotee, he was fanning Krishna. And when he was fanning Krishna, he was feeling ecstasy in the body. But he didn't like the ecstasy. He didn't like the ecstasy because the ecstasy was disturbing his service to Krishna. So the service to Krishna is more important than the ecstasy. And similarly, your ch the chanting is the important thing, not the happiness. The soul is always joyful. We're always, the nature of the soul is Satchit Ananda. So, by chanting Hare Krishna, we will awaken our spiritual nature. But our motivation should be to satisfy Krishna. We want to chant to please Krishna. There's devotional service, it can be in goodness, in passion, in ignorance, but there is also pure devotional service. And pure devotional service is done simply for the pleasure of Krishna. We don't think what I'm getting, we don't think, oh, I'll get rid of all my bad karma, 
We don't think I'll get a good name or anything. No, we just simply, I, I want to serve Krishna. I want to please Krishna. Krishna is pleased when we're chanting the holy name. So we want to please Krishna by our chanting. Maharaj. Yes? In the same context, as Prabhu told that, uh, chant and be happy. We're happy and then chant. But when we see many times uh, the scriptures or the, the Acharya is still that we should chant with the, with the separation, the mode of separation, or you should cry for the mercy of the Lord. Or, you know, in that mood we have to chant or we have to, or happily we have to chant. As you said, we should chant for the pleasure of the Krishna, that is right. But uh, in that means also we should chant with the mood of separation. Yes, Prabhupada did say. Prabhupada did say, he said, uh, we, we, sh uh, we should be like a child separated from the parent. You know, a young child, small child loses the mother, and so they will cry for the mother. And so the same way, our, he said, our chanting can be like that, you know, that we've, you know, we're calling for Krishna, our father, and Krishna is also our mother, so we're calling for him by chanting his name. Now, other times also we've had devotees say yeah, we, 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 should, we have to cry for Krishna, to get Krishna. Uh, uh, there's one price to purchase Krishna, to get love for Krishna, and you have to have the intense desire to achieve it. We have that very strong loyam, that you want it very badly, you want to love Krishna, so much so that you will shed tears, you will cry. But the crying can be done in the heart. It doesn't have to be in, from the eyes. You don't have to make a big scene in front of everyone. We can cry yeah, yeah, yeah. in the heart, right? So that's the idea. You don't, you don't want to just put on a show in front of people and sit and go on crying for Krishna. No, the crying is done in the heart. Yeah, correct. But when we cry, then we don't feel the happiness. Yes. Well, happiness or sadness, see, the soul is always happy. So when we're chanting, we will certainly feel the connection to Krishna. We should, we should know that, that the nature of the soul to, is to be joyful. Prabhupada saw one devotee looking very morose. And he, Prabhupada told him, you, he said, you cannot be in Krishna consciousness if you are morose. So devotee is always joyful by nature. And so when he's chanting or not chanting, still he's joyful. He's serving Krishna all the time. He's a joyful soul. But that joy, you know, we have to be, we have to also control. We don't want to just make a show. You know, joyful, oh, I'm so happy, oh, I'm so joyful. No, we have to serve Krishna. Just like we, we cry in the heart, the joy can also be within. We, we have to be engaged, we have to do our service for Krishna, we have to be practical. Don't just be only emotional and sentimental. Yes? Yes, Maharaj. Understood, Maharaj. Maharaj? Yes, Maharaj? Maharaj, I have a question uh, related to uh, the topic that we discussed earlier regarding uh, women. Okay. Um, working uh, for women is not allowed. Um, as they should be protected and it will cause a lot of... Um, um, I mean, independence to women will be will have problems in future. But um, for example, if the woman itself is the is the breadwinner, then uh, what happens, Maharaj? Is it allowed for women to work in that case? Yes, yes, I'm I'm familiar with that kind of situation. It sometimes it sometimes does happen like that. That the woman is the breadwinner in the family for different reasons, you know, somehow or other, that, that the husband is not able to quite do everything 
There's, but the wife is as somehow she's able to get bigger salary and command a bigger position and so on. So she's the breadwinner in the family. So what about that situation? So then the husband has to stay at home, take care of the home. <laughs> somehow it's difficult, but sometimes it's like that cannot be avoided. You know, it's not very ideal, unfortunately. And, and it shouldn't be like that for a, too, for a very long time. You know, sometimes a husband has health problems and he has to stop working and then the wife has to take over, go to work and she becomes the provider for the family, the breadwinner. But it's not ideal, with the, it's a great strain for the wife, for the woman, that she has to go out to work and, uh, and do all of this. What can be done? It shouldn't go on for, forever, that somehow, the, eventually, the, there should come a point where the, the woman can also stop working and she can be at home. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, yeah. the same contest. Is there any midway? Example, uh, we are picking up the uh, type of profession. What thing? Like if she can be a, a teacher to the uh, small group of children, where she can also uh, utilize her qualities to bring up the children, the society. Maybe, maybe she may be helpful with Krishna consciousness also. Or preaching of her attitude, and she can earn, and she can also teach the children. Is, is it like that? What type of profession women are? Although due to the uh, situation that they have to be outside for working to win the bread, but what type of profession they are going to select so they can be more in the mode of goodness or controlled, and all those things which are better for the woman. Yes. Yeah, you're making a nice point. I, I appreciate your point there, that you're saying that women, they, they, they could be more selective about the, the work which they do. They could work in a, in, a, in a better environment rather than just simply going for the big money and going into the corporate world and working with all the men. That might be better if they, you know, take a, a more uh, feminine type, type of environment environment, working with young children in a school as a teacher. The salary may be less, but it's a, certainly it's a, a little better atmosphere. Mm, yeah, I, yeah, I think you're, you've, that's a good point. You know, women can think like that, but, you know, not every family is able to uh, adjust like that. Sometimes the, the economic demands are so great, you know, the paying for the education of the children and whatever other things they have to meet, the different responsibilities of the family and they just think, oh, you know, go and take the highest salary. But if people actually understand the, you know, the, the big salary, big money, it's not going to be very secure and the working environment is not very pleasant then they should think like that. They should think about the overall effect. And I think you're, you've made a very nice point that it's better that you can just simply be a teacher and like that. Just simply teach in the school. Maybe the money's less, but the hours are not so demanding. And uh, the environment is certainly much nicer. Yeah, I always encourage people like where I when, when I travel in China, I encourage people that they, they can do things like teach yoga. You know, if they teach yoga, it's certainly a nice environment for them to be in rather than working in some other big commercial enterprise. And uh, they may not make so much money, but it's a bit, it's certainly more, bet, it's better on their own consciousness. Maharaj, one more thing. Now, example, live example of my life. Example, my wife is a housewife. But I've seen 
my other god brothers wives who are working at, as a teacher or some other areas due to that that exposure they are very good in preaching or my wife is very shy type she only supports me so her preaching style is to support me or sometimes take care of children if they are coming at home okay but those uh, matajis which are who are working outside they are very very much good in preaching the uh, cult preaching cult as compared to my wife so how i should understand sometimes i feel oh, so nice this mataji is so nice because they are working outside so they know how to preach how to speak with other matajis how to bring them to the krishna consciousness whereas my mataji is not that much uh, conversant and uh, i don't know this also one of the effect what i what i found so how to uh, understand this part well everyone has their own particular nature you see you can like we were seeing here today the abhijatasya people are born with a particular nature you know somebody's nature is to be very outgoing and they talk a lot and they love to be with people and they're very sociable like that and and other people they're more shy and more reserved and you know they don't speak so much like so everyone has their own different nature it's not so easy to just change people it's not that you put everybody out to work and everybody goes out to work they'll automatically become a good talker and they'll be able to teach talk to people and preach to people and make devotees it's not like that you know we have to understand everybody's nature and people should be engaged according to their nature we should recognize every individual's propensity and let them work accordingly You know, somebody like you described, somebody is working outside. They may be teacher and so on, because certainly as a teacher, they're talking all the time and they're instructing and looking after all the children. So you know, they they can be quite social. And somebody else is at home, and but they're they're very happy, and they're they're certainly they'll make a good wife. they take care of the home they have the meals ready for the husband they're always they don't argue with the husband don't quarrel with the husband they're submissive obedient somebody else goes out to work all day you know and then they come home at night and there's a, a very different thing that who cooks the meals who cooks the wife didn't cook oh, i've been out well, i can't cook i'm out all day i'm busy i'm working oh i can't take care of the house i'm working and, you know and because they they talk to people so much as well you know you can have a lot of they will argue with you as well you know, because they have their own thinking they won't agree with everything the husband says so you can have a very topsy turvy you can have a very difficult time in, in in the home when the woman's going out to work because she becomes much more aggressive and much more vocal and wants to say and argue about how things should be done so there's good points and bad points in everything you don't ju don't just only see the good side to the other and you'd understand there's also problems there there's also difficulties there so we should be satisfied we should appreciate the situation we're in and we should think krishna has put me in the best situation we should krishna understands everyone and he puts everyone in the situ the best situation for them very nice brother thank you varaj thank you varaj any other questions here okay so if there are no more questions maybe we'll just finish off here tonight and uh, next week no uh, we'll be on sunday night we'll go on to chapter 17 which is certainly it's a very interesting chapter the divisions of faith so please try to look over it and thank you very much for your participation here today hari krishna shrila prabhupad ki thank you thank you much hari krishna hari Hare Krishna. 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 Thank you.